So I'm Ben Blackman from the University of California at Berkeley, and today I'm going to talk about a particular type of plastic response, which is a threshold response. Many phenotypes are only expressed when the environment exceeds some critical minimum threshold or falls below some critical maximum. And we often think about these types of threshold traits in the context of polyphenism, as we just heard, where there are two alternative phenotypes, either of which is expressed depending on the environment experienced during an earlier stage of development. However, threshold traits also play a key role in the context of life history transitions. Because whether it's going from seed to seedling, or egg to hatchling, or rosette to flowering, many of these key developmental choices occur, um, are obligately dependent on environmental conditions so that they occur at times favorable for growth and reproduction. Um, the genetics of how changes in thresholds evolve hasn't received a great deal of study. Few studies have looked at whether few changes of major effect or many changes of small effect at the genetic level are responsible for shifts in threshold traits. Similarly, when we see threshold traits evolving in similar ways multiple times independently, few studies have asked whether that occurs through changes at similar or unique sets of genetic loci. And though this question of convergent genetic evolution has been asked in the context of many traits and many systems, as we've heard many times at this meeting here, it takes on a, a special significance in the context of phenotypic plasticity. Because one of the early models for how plasticity should evolve, the allelic sensitivity model, one prediction of that model could be that you have an evolution through repeated substitution of alleles of different environmental response at the same loci. A final question about how threshold traits evolve genetically is whether pleiotropy or linkage could facilitate the correlated evolution of both the value of the trait that it, when it is expressed and the threshold that determines whether or not it's expressed. To understand what I mean here, first consider a continuous environmental response. If within a generation, selection is acting to reduce the value of the expressed phenotype within a given in this environment, by necessity that's also going to change the parameters of the reaction norm, in this case, the slope. However, for a threshold trait, it's not clear that if you have selection on the value of the induced phenotype in an environment here on the y-axis, that that should also necessarily result in a change on the x-axis in the threshold that determines whether or not it's expressed. And this is more than just a sort of a basic quantitative genetics question. It's something that has real ecological implications. Because if these two parameters of the reaction norm are free to evolve independently, that allows local adaptation to be really fine-tuned to the environment. Um, in contrast, you know, if they are correlated, that does, may provide some constraint. But that also means that if selection is maintaining variation in the trait value within an environment, it's also maintaining variation in the threshold, which leads to standing variation that could adapt future um, generations to new environments or environmental challenges. So to begin to address these questions about the genetic architecture of threshold trait evolution, I've been working um, in the common monkey flower, Mimulus cutation, cutatus, and specifically on annual populations of this species. These populations have an obligate long day response in that they will only flower when the day length exceeds some critical minimum. Below that threshold, they stay as little cabbages forever and ever. Above that threshold, they flower rapidly. And previous work in the lab had shown that there's some variation among populations in that threshold parameter. Um, and it may have been um, correlated with geography. So to suss that out further, I went and did a fantastic road trip and collected populations from Southern California to Central Oregon, up and down the Sierras and the Cascades. I brought those plants back and grew up their progeny under um, a battery of photo period conditions from sh very short to very long days um, to see uh, what the photo period thresholds of these populations were. And then I also grew them up in the greenhouse to look at variability in time to flower under inductive conditions. And so for the photo period threshold um, survey, what I found did um, bear out what we uh, had thought we had seen with the pre preliminary data, which is that there's a strong uh, climb with elevation, and that high elevation populations require longer days to flower than low elevation populations. And this here elevation is likely just a proxy for climate, and that at high elevation it's cooler and wetter than at low elevation, leading to growing seasons that start later in the calendar year. So now turning to these questions about genetics and asking 
what's the genetic basis of this variation that we see along elevation declines. To do this, I crossed high and low elevation parents from multiple different transects, and I grew up their F2 progeny in growth chamber conditions where the high elevation parent would not flower, but the low elevation parent would, and took a forward genetics approach and mapped the regions of the genome responsible for variation whether or not the plants flower. Um, as you can see, these conditions differentiate the parents, and there's segregating variation in the F2, thus giving us raw material to map. And so I have done this for four of these crosses using a multiplex shotgun genotyping approach, which allowed me to repeatedly genotype the same loci in hundreds of individuals using few lanes of sequencing. And these four crosses, they fall into two nice pairs, in that the two from the Cascades and the two from the Sierra, in each of these pairs, both of the high elevation parents and both of the low elevation parents share the same phenotype, allowing us to get this question of convergent genetic evolution. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you the QTL mapping results for the cascades only for the sake of time. Um, here on the x-axis are all the markers I was able to genotype on the 14 chromosomes of the mimulus genome. And on the y-axis are the associations between the markers and whether or not the plants flowered in this condition and genome-wide significance is the dotted line. Uh, as you can see, in each of the two crosses, there's just three QTL that um, show up for, uh, as regions of the genome responsible for this variation, and one of these QTLs is shared between the two crosses. And I think these three loci in each cross capture all of the divergence between the parents, because if we count the number of low alleles per genotype, um, for, and go from all high to all low, we go from 0% to 100% flowering in both cases. So within a given transect, divergence in photo period, or a critical photo period, appears to be rather simple. The same was true in the cascades, so these might be relatively underpowered and we're collecting more data to um, bring that up further. Um, and there is that one shared QTL that we found between the two Cascades crosses, and nothing was shared between the two Sierra crosses. And really, across the entire range, only that one shared QTL was really the only QTL that popped up in any two crosses. And so that suggests there's at least eight loci that can tweak this one parameter of how flowering responds to the environment, uh, and little evidence for an allelic series um, modulating this parameter across the range. And even for the shared QTL, recent work on some great candidate genes underlying that shared QTL by my postdoc named Couriers suggests that imagining this as an allelic series is sort of a stretch. Um, so underlying this QTL, there are multiple paralogs of the flowering locus C, or MADS affecting flowering gene, uh, gene family. This is a gene family that's a powerful repressor of flowering. And um, it's not just that there's multiple, it's that there are 11 of them in a one megabase pair region. Um, and so this has been quite the puzzle in order to um, sort out, um, but Nick has done a valiant job, and what he's found is really interesting. So if we look at expression of these genes under conditions where the high elevation parent will not flower and the low elevation parent will, what we see is that some of the paralogs are upregulated in the high elevation parent and not in the low elevation parent. Uh, consistent with expectation that these won't flower with high levels of this floral repressor. Um, when we look at fine J, um, we see something similar, but instead all the parallels are upregulated in the high elevation parent relative to the low elevation parent. Um, and we know that some of these expression differences are in cis because Nick has looked at expression of these genes in F2 individuals and found that the expression difference co-segregates with genotype of the linkage group 11 QTL. Low elevation homozygotes express this at a much lower level than high elevation homozygotes or heterozygotes. And that's pleasingly, there's no signal of control from the other two QTL in this cross. Though interestingly, it's not all in cis, um, at least one of the parallels is controlled by one of the other QTLs. So it's a complex story. All right, so finally, turning to this question, about whether the regions of the genome that control the variation and whether or not the plants flower under different um, photo periods is related to how long it takes them to flower when they are induced. We can test this question by taking full sieves of the same plants that grew in the growth chamber and grow them under inductive conditions in the greenhouse. 
and see whether we get the same QTLs for time to flower under those conditions. So I've done that for two of our crosses, one from the Cascades and one from the Sierra. And here's the results from the Cascades. And purple are the QTLs I've already shown you for mapping critical photo period in the growth chamber. And in black are the QTLs that come up when we map time to flowering in the greenhouse under inductive conditions. As you can see, they don't overlap. They're on completely different linkage groups. And the same was true in the cross that we had from the Sierras. And so this indicates that variation at completely different loci explain divergence in both the critical photo period parameter and the time to flower under inductive conditions. So these are two really independently evolving subcomponents of a seasonal phenology response. And that means there's potential for evolution to act on these differently and really fine tune the reaction norms. And I think it's not just that there's potential, it's that this has actually happened. So unlike critical photo period, which increases monotonically with both, photo with both latitude and altitude, there's a change in the relationship between time to flowering and altitude across the range. So high elevation populations take longer to flower in the Sierra, but they take less time to flower in the Cascades. And what I think is going on here is there's a really complex relationship between the duration of the growth season and geography in this region. So at low elevation in the Sierra, or sorry, low elevation in California, like in the Central Valley, the growing season is short. It's bounded by drought on both sides. Plants germinate in late winter rains and have a short period of time before the onset of late spring summer drought. As you go up in the Sierra, or as you go up in latitude, um, the plants may germinate in the fall and over winter or germinate in the spring, but then they have long, lush, damp springs to grow large before they have to flower. But then when you go up in elevation in the Cascades, the growing season shortens again because it's bounded not just by drought, but also by the presence of the snowpack. And that these plants can't really start taking off until the um, melting of the snowpack, which happens in late May, early June, and they have maybe six weeks before the onset of summer drought. And so critical photo period is tracking the beginning of the growth season, which increases with both latitude and altitude. But the timing of the growth, the duration of the growth season, um, is what the time to flower under inductive conditions is tracking. And so because these two parameters are not controlled by the same loci, or variation doesn't appear in them at the same loci, they lack genetic correlations that constrain the ability to adapt to this complex range. And I think this lack of genetic correlation has really helped annual populations of this species spread over a much larger genetic range than many, many species within the genus. Um, and so overall, I've shown you there's abundant genetic variation. Divergence within a local region is genetically simple, but across the range it's quite complex. Um, and that absence of genetic correlations may have facilitated the broad geographic range of these populations. Um, with that, I'll thank the folks in my lab who've worked on this, put up two plugs, and take any questions. Thank you. Is there a difference in either the, pre in the predictability or the variance in, uh, in low elevate, in the California start of the growing season versus, let's say, the high, and is that related to the amount of genetic variation for plasticity? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is whether there's, uh, year, year to year, whether there's large variability in the timing, the start versus the duration of the growth season. And there's definitely temporal variation from year to year, certainly that's seen um, in uh, high elevation in California, where the, or sorry, in Oregon, where the Kelly Lab has done lots of work. Um, if you just look at sort of biofilm variables, uh, seasonality, there are seasonality differences between those two regions, and that's something that we hope to follow up on there. That could be but yeah, is there any relationship, parent relationship to the amount of QTLs or something that you find? Yeah, so that's something, once, once we full, make those California data sets a little fuller, we'll be able to address that. Yeah, thanks.